this is my, uh, my, my son, Johnny. Um, as uh, Theo said, I, I, when he was diagnosed in 1996, I knew nothing about autism. I'm, I'm trained as a linguist and a foreign correspondent. And I just didn't know what the word was, what meant. Uh, um, I launched myself into studying research, I set up uh, looking up magazine I publish every month. That's the first ever issue which coincided with the MMR debate, the vaccine debate. I'm not sure how uh, strongly people discuss that here in Switzerland, but um, it certainly made a big splash over in 1998 in the UK. It's not responsible for autism. And the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. Any parents in the audience thinking about giving their, whether to give their um, child the vaccine, give them the vaccine. If you don't, your child will, will have a very strong risk of getting measles, and measles can kill. Uh, and I was very angry when, uh, about the MMR debate for various reasons, partly because it uh, endangered children, but also because it revived the culture of blame. The culture of blame and guilt. The parents were made to feel responsible again, just as they had been back in the 1950s, 1960s. This is my book. It came out in 19, uh, 19, 2010, not 1910. That would be a very old book. Um, so there to the key points of my um, talk today. Uh, professionals were blamed for their child's autism. That started with Leo Kanner, who first described autism in his 1943 paper. Um, it was the parents' determination to correct this horrendous uh, accusation of blame that led to the establishment of the world's first autism associations. Um, it's the parents as much as the professionals, and some like the great Lorna Wing, and we'll be hearing a lot about Lorna Wing today. Um, who have been behind the drive for true understanding of autism. And yet, unfortunately, the, the, the relationship between parents and professionals in the field of autism has never been an easy one. And, and in certain parts of the world, there's still the sense they are on opposite sides of the barrier. Um, and there's still a lot of stigma. Uh, when I researched my book on the history of autism, I went to about 100 countries around the world, 100 countries, and I met parents who said they'd been, uh, they'd, they'd uh, um, heard from other parents that they, they didn't want to live in the same area because their child might catch autism from another child with autism, as if it was an infection that you could just catch from living nearby. And they generally believe this. I think that was in China or India. I can't remember where. Uh, just very briefly before I come on to the parents, I must discuss the contrib uh, contributions of the two great professional pioneers in the field of autism. And one of the great discoveries I, ca I came to was that uh, Hans Asperger was working long, long before Leo Kanner. People talk about Leo Kanner's 1943 paper and then Hans Asperger's 1944 paper. In fact, uh, we now know Asperger, or, or I spent a, a day with Asperger's daughter in Zurich, and she showed me some uh, documents where uh, Asperger was using the term autistic psychopathy from the early 1930s. Early 1930s. We're talking about more than 10 years earlier than uh, Kanner's paper. I won't spend too much time over the actual uh, Kanner's work, because I'm sure you, most of you in the audience know that. Um, but it's important, this is the, these are the five. I, I, can, I can send the, 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 these slides to people if they want them afterwards, so I won't go in much into the paper, the 1943 paper. The important thing in, for this talk is to acknowledge that Kanna blamed the parents at first. He referred to cold, uh, detached nature of the parents of, of the children in his landmark 1943 study. He denied that he was actually suggesting the parents. He always did. He always denied. He was uh, blaming the parents. Um, but here is um, a horrendous interview he gave in 1960 to Time magazine. 
where he said, children with autism are the offspring of parents, cold and rational, who just happen to defrost long enough to produce a child. <laughs> that was Kana. And he, he, and he denied that he ever blamed the parents. I think it's there in black and white. And uh, 1973 edition of his, uh, of his book, Childhood Psychosis and New Insights, he wrote again, the emotional frigidity in a typical autistic family suggests a dynamic experiential factor in the genesis of the disorder. I think that's pretty clear cut to me. And of course he was writing at the time where Freudian thinking was very strong, but that doesn't excuse him. I've heard people say, yes, I know, you've got to understand the time he was writing, you've got to ex move, and, and, uh, move forward as a historian of autism, you've got to understand. That's ridiculous. That's like saying you've got to understand uh, Hitler because, he was, because of the time he was uh, uh, living. Absolutely not true. Kanner was a very intelligent man. He could have moved forward and moved the argument forward much earlier than he did. Uh, here is the quote from... Um, Leo Kanner's speech to the inaugural meeting of America's National Society of Autistic Parents. Herewith, I especially acquit you people as parents. I have been misquoted many times from the very first publication to the last. I spoke of this condition in no uncertain terms as innate, but because I described some of the characteristics of the parents as persons, I was misquoted often as having said that it's all the parents' fault. Those of you parents who've come to see me with your children know this isn't what I said. Yeah, well, we know it is from, what the, from that interview in time. As a matter of fact, I tried to relieve parental anxiety when they'd been made anxious by such speculation. I was very lucky to be able to speak. I had spent a day with Leo Eisenberg, who was Leo Kanner's closest colleague. Incredible privilege uh, in Boston. And when I asked him about... Uh, um, Kanna's blaming the parents. Of course, he was very loyal to Kanna. He said, Kanna made the rather bold suggestion for the time that this autism was an inborn error of affective contact. Kanna thought and told me he thought that the notion that it was inborn, that is congenital, perhaps genetic, but not specified, delayed the acceptance of autism because those were the days when psychiatry was entirely, entirely psychogenic in its orientation. Now we come to Hans Asperger, as I said, his daughter lives here in Switzerland, in, Zur in Zurich. I spent a day with her, and we, uh, she, has, um, she wrote a chapter in a book with a lot of uh, interesting uh, material as well. And uh, I won't go into too much detail about discoveries I made, uh, which are not relevant to this talk. Um, he was working in the early 30s. His daughter, Dr. Maria Aspegerfelder, agreed that he might have had traits of his own syndrome. He liked to be on his own quite a lot. Um, this, and, um, this was his 1938 paper, which is uh, six years before the paper that everybody normally quotes, the 1944 paper. Very interesting paper because um, he uses, deliberately uses Nazi style vocabulary to deceive the Nazis. In fact, he was actually, what he was actually saying was that uh, these children are abnormal in some ways, but they have tremendous contribution to society. Again, I can, if you want some of these slides, I can send, you to, send them to you later. That's the 1944 paper. These are uh, some of the characteristics. As you know, or I'm sure a lot of you know, Asperger's syndrome will be removed as a separate category um, in DSM-5 when it's published in uh, next year, May of next year. Um, that's a uh, uh, controversial move. I know some people who uh, absolutely approve of the idea and some people with Asperger's syndrome I've spoken to who need the label. Some just don't like the label at all. So it, it, it's a very complicated issue and I haven't got time to go into that now. Um, the strengths of Asperger's research that he, he never blamed the parents like, as Kanna did. 
Uh, he came to recognize uh, wide variations in his condition, as we would uh, uh, now call the autistic spectrum, or the autism spectrum, introduced by Lorna Wing in the late 1970s. Um, he, came to, he came very early, Asperger, to accept that there were broad manifestations of this strange condition. Kanna himself never accepted that there were various different kinds of autism. His very restricted criteria, he stuck to those to the end of his life and he thought people were uh, diluting the uh, description of his unique syndrome. And there are some people who agree with that today, that it's become too broad. Um, and Asperger also showed a humane acceptance of the value of difference. And now we come to uh, Bruno Bettelheim. Um, because he was, I mean, he wasn't, as I've shown, uh, the first to blame the parents. Canada did this. Um, but he institutionalized it almost. Um, with his school, the Orthogenic School, and with this incredibly popular book, The Empty Fortress, published in 19, 1967, which was, he was lionized. He was absolutely um, praised by everybody in the field, not in the field, but uh, certainly in the press, in the media. The, the media loved him. A lot of professionals loved him. But he uh, literally wanted to cut the parents off from their children because the parents were the evil influence. Uh, he said the precipitating factor of infantile autism is the parents wish uh, that his child should not exist. Um, and I was told that um, uh, one uh, Bettelheim turned to one of the children in his school, in his school, the orthogenic school in Chicago. There was a statue. In the, play, in the playground, a, a big stone statue, and one, uh, Bettelheim, Bettelheim turned to one of the children and said, you see this statue? That's like your mother. It's cold and hard. That's uh, the kind of man he was, but the extraordinary thing is, the extraordinary thing is that some parents loved that book. It's um, something that it has to be pointed out. Some parents love the empty fortress and said, you know, he's, de he's describing autism the way we understand it. So uh, it also explains his popularity. I'll, go, uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so the strength of the Freud Freudian influence in the United States. A lot of European refugees came um, from Europe with Freud in their luggage almost. They came, they brought it with them. Freudian thinking came with the baggage, with their, but there were, some of them were scientists, some of them were philosophers, and they, a lot of them came with Freud's ideas, and it spread like wildfire. Then there was the continuing resistance to accept genetic rather than emotional factors. This is an interesting thing that I, I emphasize in my book, um, that because of the Nazi, the legacy of the Nazi period, people were very reluctant to, to accept that genes can influence behavior because it sounded like you were bringing in echoes of uh, eugenics, of uh, the Nazi ideas. So people tend to, ten, uh, tended to prefer to feel it was an emotional, these conditions were emotionally caused. And then, of course, there was a notion that if something was caused by parents, it could be undone. Uh, I remember Donato Vivanti, a lot of you may know the name, um, former president of Autism Europe, um, head of the Italian autism organization. She told me that uh, Italian parents preferred to think that there was something that they, they had caused because maybe if they could then re undo, reverse the process. Whereas if it was genetic, that was it. They were stuck with it. And in France, there's a particular situation, historically, that the psychoanalysts tended to be in the resistance to the Nazis, whereas the geneticists were largely collaborationists with the Nazis, and that has led, in my view, to the um, prolongation, and partly a part of the factor, for the prolongation of the um, psychogenic approach to autism, uh, dominating a lot of the thinking in parts of France, not all, Paris, uh, Tour it's better than Paris. It's, imp it's improving, but still pretty, pretty bad in France. Um, in the Empty Fortress, 
Bettelheim openly attacked Leo Kanner for viewing autism as a biological disorder, and in Bettelheim's view, for ignoring one of Freud's greatest lessons in Bettelheim's way of seeing things by failing to question the underlying motivations driving an individual's motivations. And Leo Kanner hit back very strongly, and he renamed the empty fortress the empty book. Good for him. And while we're here, by the way, while, <laughs> while we're here in Geneva, I should point out that he used the work of Jean Piaget as the basis. I'm not blaming Jean Piaget at all, by the way. Let me emphasize I'm not blaming Piaget for uh, Bettelheim's views, but uh, he did quote Piaget when he was, uh, Bettelheim when he was um, talking about the, one of uh, his famous cases, Marcia, at the school. And Bettelheim never, ever changed his views on the emotional causation of autism. Uh, Thomas Kemper, who with Margaret Bauman uh, produced the first uh, study, neurological study uh, of uh, abnormalities in the brain of autism, 19, 1985. Um, he told me in Boston that Bettelheim called him up once and said, and, and Thomas Kemper said, well, what do you think? We've discovered a brain abnormality in autism. Doesn't that change your view of autism? And Bettelheim says, no, no. There are two kinds of autism, yours and mine. <laughs> and then uh, Frankie Happy, Francesca Happy told me um, uh, that Bettelheim came to give a talk in, uh, in London in the late 1980s. It wasn't a talk about autism, but at the end of the talk, a woman got in the audience got up and said, now, nah, Dr. Bettelheim, that's all very interesting. Well, what about your work in autism? Do you believe that the parents are still to blame? And he said, of course, 100%. I'm still convinced that uh, the parents are around. That was the late 1980s. Okay, here we are. Um, coming into one of the great figures, the, one of the truly great figures uh, in, uh, in autism research, but also a parent, of course. Sadly, Lorna Wing had a daughter. Uh, with aut severe autism called Susie, uh, wonderful, um, uh, who died at the age of 50. Uh, this, is, this is a photo of me visiting Lorna at her house down in Sussex. She's now moved, sadly, because her husband John died, so she's moved to a small flat, lives on her own. Um, but here she is in, in smiling, happy days. I, loved, I, quite, I like this photo. And she showed me, Lorna showed me, actually, um, a row of um, plastic teapots. Susie, her daughter, used to collect teapots. Loved it, and pretending to pour tea. Now, I've got a question for the, to throw out to the audience here. Isn't that pretend play? Because she, she preferred to use pretend teapots to pour tea to a real teapot. Hang on a minute. I thought we were, you know, I thought... Uh, People with, children with autism weren't supposed to be able to use to pretend play. Well, that was pretty convincing to me, but um, if anyone wants to meet, talk to, about that afterwards to me, I'm, I'm available all day. Um, up to the end of the 1950s, this is a quote from Lorna Wing about the situation, because she was one of the true pioneers, as I said, in getting the National Autistic Society off the ground, which is, the, if not the first, one of the very, very first organizations for parents in the world. Up to the end of the 1950s, the general public was profoundly ignorant concerning autism, and the same was true of most professionals, even psychiatrists and psychologists. Among the few who were interested and aware, many agreed with the theory that the children were potentially normal, but had been made to withdraw by cold, distant, over intellectual parents. Diagnosis was difficult or impossible to obtain, and there was no help or support for the parents. Children could be excluded from education at school if they had severe learning difficulties or disruptive behavior, and there were virtually no special schools for children with autism. In those days, for most parents of young children with autistic disorders, it was a bleak and lonely existence with no source of information, help, or support talking about the late 1950s, early 1960s. But 
things began to change in the 1960s for two reasons which Lorna Wing picks out. One was the development of objective scientific investigation into autistic disorders, which showed that the children had real disabilities underlying their unusual patterns of behavior. The approach of the pioneering research was very different from the armchair theorizing that had gone before. And the other reason for the improvement in the situation was the creation of the National Autistic Society, NAS, in the UK. Um, and at that point, there was early harmony. I've talked about uh, the, sen the sense that sometimes the parents and professionals have been uh, on the opposite side of the barrier. Uh, but in those days, certainly in the UK, um, professionals were brought in very quickly, as Lorna Wing said. Uh, or, and uh, she actually goes as far as to say that very soon there were almost as many professionals as, as parents. Um, Mike Rutter, Michael, Professor Sir Michael Rutter was brought in, and some of, you know, Laurie Bartek studies were used, uh, and um, there was a, a quick acknowledgement in the UK at least that parents and professionals should work as a team. Sadly, not true um, in many parts of the world, certainly at that time and still today. This was the great study that Lorna Wing and Judith Gould uh, carried out in 1979 in Camberwell in South London, where they introduced the concept of the autistic spectrum and the triad of impairments. Um, Lorna Wing, of course people talk about this study, but I should uh, emphasize that when I traveled around the world, one of the things that parents have told me more than anything else is when you, they say, when you see Lorna Wing next in, London, in England, please thank her from the bottom of our hearts because she saved, almost saved our lives with her book, 1971 book on autism. Um, because the first book ever published on autism in Spanish, in Spain, was The, em the Empty Fortress. So the book that parents were first reading was the Bettelheim book on autism. And it was only just four or five years later that Lorna Wing's book was translated. And that was a book that changed people's uh, thinking on autism, really reassured the parents that they weren't to blame for their child's condition. Um, I'm conscious, I'm, uh, being in Switzerland, I'm conscious, I'm conscious of the uh, this is the home of the clock, so I'm going to try and stick to time. Um, this uh, Autism Denver, these are some of the other early parents associations founded around the world. Um, Autism Denmark, founded in 1962. I must mention two remarkable women here that people don't talk about at all, but I, I, in my book I do. One was D Dr. Birte Hög Brask better known in Denmark as Triller, and Elsa Hansen. And Brask's husband was the main organizer of the resistance movement against the Nazis in Denmark. In fact, they met in the resistance in, in Copenhagen. In 1972, uh, Brask published one of, one of the first ever um, epidemi one of the earliest epidemiological studies of autism, and she had close links to Lorna Wing. And Elsa Hansen founded the Sophia School in Copenhagen in 1964. Um, that's the first school for what was then called psychotic children, but we'd record in, in the Nordic countries. First ever school for Nordic, uh, in Nordic countries for psychotic children, but we'd recognize them now as being autistic. Um, and there was a big conflict between these two women, Birte Hergrask uh, and Elsa Hansen. That was because uh, parts of Copenhagen remained strongly psychoanalytical uh, in the 1960s, whereas Aarhus, which is where Blask uh, um, was bo uh, based, was uh, uh, more uh, organic in thinking. Um, and at one conference, Hansen gave a speech, and as she stepped down from the platform, she could clearly be heard to say, and now I'm going to sit at the back of the hall so I don't have to hear the nonsense spoken by Birte Brask. So it uh, got very personal between the professionals in those days. Um, 
Irish Society, 1963. Um, strangely enough, uh, after the initial birth of enthusiasm subsided, services remained woefully inadequate in, in Ireland, especially for adults. Uh, adults continued to be cared for in totally unsuitable psychiatric hospitals in Ireland. Much better today, the situation. Um, I haven't got time to go much into Australia and Scotland, but there's a lot more about that in my book. Now we come to the other big area of pioneering parents in the world of the history of autism. Bernie Rimbland uh, and Ruth Sullivan in the United States. Of course, there were other great parent, uh, parent pioneers. Remarkable figure, I must quote, uh, Claire Claiborne Park, who wrote an extraordinary book called The Siege, um, 1967, about her daughter, Jessie. Actually, she called her Ellie to, to um, disguise, to protect her real identity. Just, and that was a very important book because that showed just how warm and loving parents of children with autism could be and how hard they had to fight to get the professionals to understand them. And I recommend The Siege and uh, his sequel, Exiting Nirvana, uh, for um, the humanity of, their write, of her writing. And in those books... Um, Claire Claiborne Park speaks of refrigerator professionals rather than refrigerator parents, refrigerator mothers. Um, Bernie Rimland, who's sadly no longer with us, had an autistic son, Mark, who is today a very talented artist, and Ruth's son is Joe Sullivan. I don't know whether you know about him. He was one of the models for Rain Man, for Dustin Hoffman character, Raymond Babbitt in Rain Man, one of the main models for it. He did the match counting. You remember in Rain Man, D uh, Raymond Babbitt, Dustin Hoffman counts match count, mat but that's based on Joe. And Joe Sullivan, I visited him in his adult home in um, West Virginia, and I tried, I really tried hard to coax him into... Uh, doing the match counting trick and he f refused completely in fact uh, his well you've got to try haven't you you've got to try but, um, uh, but his carers told me uh, he never does these he's got more social and as he's got more social he's lost some of these other savant um, trick now that brings in the whole uh, and it's a whole other argument about this dreaded trade off whether if uh, you become more social, less autistic in some ways, do you lose some of the savant skills? I know this is a big argument in the case of someone like Nadia, for instance, the famous uh, girl in Nottingham who started to draw these kind of prehistoric style drawings and then when she started to speak and started to get more social, she stopped drawing. But I know uh, this is a very complicated issue. Darrell Treffert, who's the world leading expert, a great friend of mine, we discussed this for hours. He, he denies the trade-off exists. Um, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I've seen it happen in some cases. Um, Bernard Wimbledon, uh, he, wrote, he wrote a fantastic book in 1964. I, I highly, I don't know how many people in the audience know this book. It still stands up in some ways, certainly as a, as, as a, a book of reference to look at some of these early biological studies, because he set out specifically to demolish Bruno Bettelheim's parent-blaming approach by demonstrating that autism was an organic condition, not, not uh, uh, caused by the parents. And he became a hero. Rimland, quite rightly, became a hero for many parents, although later on he dived down some of these rather disreputable, unscientifically proven um, by a lot, biomedical methods, which are peddled, and I'll come to that in a minute, peddled by complete and utter charlatans who should be knocked out of the profession, kept locked out and never allowed to practice. But unfortunately, they, they, keep, they are kept going. Um, here's an extract, extract from the uh, book, Rimland's book. There appears to be an implicit assumption that the uniqueness of the parental personalities constitutes evidence only for the environmental side of the controversy. It is apparently assumed that the parental personalities are too specific to be biologically determined 
and not capable of being transmitted genetically. He said, Bernie Rimlin set out to show that that was wrong, that uh, it was transmitted genetically. We now know, of course, from twin studies, from uh, Falstein and Rutter's famous 1977 study onwards, we now know, and especially the, the twin studies of identical twins, that uh, if one twin is autistic, the other twin is 90% likely to have, to have autism. Not 100%, so there must be something else going on, but very, very highly heritable autism. Genetically heritable, not emotionally. And here he was um, speaking to the inaugural uh, Congress of the National Society of Autistic Children in Washington, 1969. By the way, that meeting, the first meeting of the parents in 1969 in America, that coincided precisely with the, land, the, land, the moon landing. So it didn't get, a, perhaps didn't get as much coverage in the, as the media that it should have done, because it, in July 1969 was when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Um, we should wear a cloth, he said, so strong that no one can tear us apart. That was Remlin's. So he was trying to get the parents to form this solid caucus that couldn't be ripped apart. Uh, of course, we have on the other side, we had Ruth Sullivan talking to me in West Virginia saying, of course the parents can tear each other apart. And that does happen. I think we have to recognize that. I'm, if I have time, I'll explain a bit uh, about how parents can rip each other apart. There is conflict in all human organizations, but there is more passion behind an organization for people with autism than I suspect any other disability in the world. It is true. When you meet parents' associations, the parents are incredibly passionate fighters for the cause of autism. We've heard about the great Eric Schopler. He set up Teach, and you'll hear much more about that from Lee. Um, Marcus later on. He founded Teach partly because of what he'd seen as the horrendous thinking established by Bruno Bettelheim at his school. Um, Schopler very quickly understood the vital role of incorporating the parents in the process of educating autistic children as well as using the latest research and working with autism and not against it. Some other uh, educational approaches, I won't name them, well, ABA, okay. <laughs> I will name them. Uh, seem to work against autism. In my view, not with them. But ABA, you have to say, sadly, is popular around the world. It shouldn't be as popular as it is. In China, they use it. Uh, teach, I, I far prefer the philosophy of teach, as I say. But, but um, ABA seems to have... Uh, gained a hold in certain countries inexplicably to me. Inexplicably, it shouldn't do. Um, these are well, two of the teach parents, and then uh, Bobo Warren and Betty Camp, uh, and Brenda, who was a colleague of Schopler. Um, they all shared a love and admiration for Schopler. And Bobo here, Bobo Warren, told me a wonderful anecdote of what happened at the, the historic, it was an historic fundraising breakfast, I'm sure Lee remembers this, uh, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina in the early 1970s when the drive really started to launch Teach in that American state and the governor arrived late for the breakfast. Were you, were you at that breakfast, Lee? Oh. Well, um, he arrived late for the breakfast apparently and, he, and uh, the governor was forced to sit down at the table with all the autistic children and Bobo's son, George, was one of these children spent the rest of the meal feeding the governor bread. <laughs> and later, the governor said, I will not stop until I find out, until I find a way to help these children. I should have said that in a North Carolina accent, but I, I wouldn't, I'd be ashamed with, with Lee. Um, I've mentioned the problems in France already. 1980s, all child psychologists and psychiatrists in France were trained in psychoanalysis. psychoanalysis only, only Argentina in the world, can, I think, can match this. Uh, some of you may have seen Sandrine Bonner's very powerful film, Elle s'appelle bon, uh, Sabine, which has extraordinary scenes of uh, Sabine 
before she went into the institution playing Bach's first prelude, and then after a few years of being drugged, not, not being able to remember the, uh, the notes. Very sad, very powerful, very, an indictment. This is a documentary on autism called Le Mur, which I, as far as I know, the late, I think it may have been banned while there's a legal, I think there was some legal, uh, yes, it's still banned, but I, I had a, a chance to see it before and uh, it, it was actually very clever because he gave uh, psychiatrists a chance to show how stupid they were, a lot of them, by, by quoting their comments. Example of a Spain example of a good collaboration between parents, Isabel Mayonas, uh, is Angel Rivier, Angel. Uh, um, uh, Isabel Bayona set up APNA in uh, her own house in, um, in Madrid. Um, she was, uh, she's an interesting figure. She uh, was one uh, of uh, Spain's first bullfighters. Would you believe? Bayona was a bullfighter by profession. One of uh, the only woman bullfighters in Spain. Um, autistic son, David, is a remarkable guy. He can tell you absolutely everything about Real Madrid. And also an astonishing memory for dates. If you tell him when you were born, he'll remember that 10 years later. Um, and Isabel Bayonas always says that APNA, the Parents Association in Spain, was protected by the angels, and she means the two angels here. Angel Rivier, I wish I had more time to talk about him. Angel Rivier in the middle was a remarkable man. He was a, a, a talented poet, a violinist. Um, died tragically young in, in 2000, at the age of just 50. Man of vast intellectual um, curiosity, very seductive personality, huge spirit of humanity, capacity to empathize with others. And it was Angel Rivier who introduced the notion into Spain that autism was a developmental disorder in 1978. And Angel Diez Cuervo on the right, uh, still very much alive, I'm glad to say. I met him in Madrid not long ago. A charming man, lived through all the bad old psychogenic days, uh, battling for more scientific research. Um, I haven't got much time to go into Argentina, uh, Latin America. Latin America, you just have to bear in mind that the countries where Jacques Lacan, Freud, Melanie Klein, or the psychoanalytical thinking, where that's strongest, that's where you'll find wrong thinking, in, in, um, erroneous and misleading, and sometimes dangerous thinking about autism. It is changing. Situation in Mexico uh, is again changing, as Edna, the wonderful Edna Garcia has, has told me. Uh, but there are pockets where they still can see autism as a problem of emotional development. Alfonso Cuaron, people know him, director of uh, um, Mama Tambien, but also the Harry Potter film, uh, Azkaban. He has a son with autism and, and took a year out of life, life working to uh, look after his son. Situation in Africa is terrible. Um, you know, tribal difference of opinion. Some, uh, some, people, uh, some tribes consider it a, a blessing. Some consider autism a curse. There are terrible misconceptions remain. Um, as in rural Africa, I am South Africa. I, I saw um, some uh, children, I heard about anyway, some children being given hydrochloric acid to, uh, so they should spit out the, this, this evil spirit called autism. That's in South Africa, which is one of the most, more, sophi more sophisticated countries, Africa. So there are, despite the improvements we've seen, thanks to parents largely, and some enlightened pe uh, professionals, some misconceptions, and some, of the, some parents, uh, some, sorry, some professionals, or call themselves professionals, are actually charlatans taking advantage of parents' desperate need to find help for their autistic child. There's electric shocks. There's a school in Boston, uh, sorry, in Massachusetts, which used to use, until recently, used to use electric shocks on their autistic children. Um, look, packing, I'm sure a lot of you know about this, is used in France. You wrap wet sheets 
around autistic children for half an hour at a time, damp, cold, chilled, wet sheets, uh, to try and supposedly to try and uh, regulate sensory abnormalities. And this process is funded by, or the research is funded by the French government. I haven't got time to go into all of this, but these are examples. Yeah, okay, very soon I bet you see. This is, this is the Swiss pressure, Swiss timing. Um, very quickly, Chan Hui Ping. These are, these are some of today's parents' he, uh, heroes. Chan Hui Ping in, in China, remarkable, set up the first woman, uh, sorry, set up the first private school for autis autistic children on mainland China called, with wonderful name of Stars and Rain. Um, she fought off, she, she still fights the, the Chinese government. She says the government is guilty of what, if one's guilty, she, the, the uh, Chinese government has what autistic children have, developmental delay. That's how she sees it. Mary Berua, uh, another one of the great mother pioneers. She's probably done more than any other woman to increase the understanding of autism, not just in India, but in the whole of South Asia. Um, she, she's fought professionals for years trying to persuade them that it's not a rare disorder. She said in 1995 she was told that there were no people with autism in the Indian subcontinent by a professional. 1995 she said, there are, we don't need to bother with autism, we don't have any autism here. That was not, so that shows you what she's got to do. Zemi Yen, was having, I wish I had more time, she, uh, set up, she, was a, she set up the first beauty school in Ethiopia, would you believe. But she's also now set up, when her, when her son was uh, diagnosed with autism, she set up the fir Ethiopia's first center for autism, the Joy Center in 2002. She's now got 72 children, autism and developmental disorders. I'm now going to embarrass people in this audience by showing some of these. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have more time. Otherwise, I'd embarrass them more. And oh, look who's that. Another one. I don't have more time. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Oh, can I finally just give me one minute? To, to a bit of, thank you so much. This, uh, just a publicity for the online conference. This starts as soon as I get back in on Monday. International online conference. I have some flyers. But um, we have 60, I organize this every year, 60 professionals online, um, 60 papers are online. You can go online, you can register at that email address at the top. Donna Williams, Wendy Lawson taking part, Lucy Hawking, daughter of Stephen Hawking, um, Dowell Trefford, I mentioned in my tour, Tito. Some people may know that they're all taking part. You can put your questions directly to them. It's a, a, a unique uh, uh, opportunity. Um, and so, uh, just to conclude, I would say where parents and professionals now, I think, coincide more or less is in realizing that, when, as I think you quoted Stephen Shaw, Theo, when you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. True. Or, uh, to put it another way, uh, every autistic child is as different as every hotel shower. Every shower I've found, been to around the world has a different mechanism. And just like every autistic child is uh, different, so is every autistic. You have to work out the mechanism each time. Thank you for your attention.